a second. All right. So now we're recording. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Lisa Scheuer, the president of Restopathies Network. Hi. So I'm Lisa Scheuer. Um, I started this uh, with um, encouragement from the leadership of the Costello Syndrome Family Network, the CFC International, and the Noonan Syndrome Foundation. Uh, sorry, the Noonan Syndrome Support Group way back um, to be a network interface between the family organizations and the researchers. And there's my son, Quinn, who had Costello Syndrome with Turner, both when she was an infant and as she's growing. <laughs> Next, please. It should be turning, it's just slow. Okay, signal. So yeah, Quinn had the G12S mutation on HRAS, which is the most common. And there, great. So here we are, the Rasopathies Network. Um, please come and check out our website if you haven't. And if you have any suggestions or ideas, we are always open to them. So um, you can click on contact us and uh, respond that way. And we really would appreciate any information or suggestions um, to make our site better. So here's a list of our board of directors. I'm the president, uh, Lisa Shows, the vice president. We have Beth Stronach here, as, who's the secretary. Bruce Deckman was not able to make it uh, today. He's on a family trip to the, some Finger Lakes, I think. And we have um, at large both Lee Johnson and Elizabeth Parker. So here's the slide we like to use to show how we're all related. Um, we do have some, some similar features that overlap among all of us. And the really crucial thing is how we have mutations along this pathway that is sort of like, I think of it as the mousetrap game where, you know, as one thing goes, as the marble goes all the way down. And the problem with all our mutations is that we have um, a gain of function problem. So there's too much information, too many marbles going through. And so our process of trying to work on uh, therapies that help us is to try to um, control the flow basically and so okay next slide <laughs> oh here's Bruce <laughs> just to give you a, a picture of his family he's new to our board um, he just joined so we're excited to have him and always any help we can get right yes Oh, and then this is me, <laughs> so <laughs> we're switching to me. Um, so hi, I'm the Vice President of the Rosopathies Network, um, and this is some of my family members. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about one of our major fundraisers we do every year, um, raising money for international Rosopathies research grants. And we do it through um, the University of Pennsylvania with the Penn Million Dollar Bike Ride. And if we raise $20,000, um, it will be matched. We've been doing it for the last seven or eight years, um, having people ride, having people volunteer, having people make giving pages. Um, even if you don't ride a bike, um, you can raise funds um, by creating a page and asking for support. And 100% of what you raise goes towards the grant and will be matched. So it's probably one of the best fundraisers um, out there. And just to get an idea of what we funded, um, these are the grants um, that we funded over the last few years. Um, at our scientific symposium, we also have these researchers discuss um, those topics. And um, so we've had things on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, on um, just kind of advancing treatments, um, more basic science, um, gastro uh, gastrointestinal problems, um, and this year we've done something in pain before and this year we're, we're trying to do one in adults. So um, some of our board members and friends of the Rosopathies um, are, re are reading all the grant applications right now to decide on who should get um, that money and we'll announce 2020's $65,000 grant recipient in January. So you can help by riding in Philadelphia. It's gonna be this June. Um, it might go virtual again, but either way, you can always participate virtually. We'd like to see a lot more international support around this event because we do give the funds 
um, not just in the US, but to international researchers as well. You can volunteer at the water stop if, stop if it's in person. Um, create a giving page. Here's a wonderful um, giving page that one of um, our families created and you can help spread the word. We usually start doing the giving pages at the end of February, beginning of March. Um, but if you'd like to be involved at all in this project, um, please feel free to contact me. My email's here um, for any questions. I can help you set up a giving page, give you ideas, or if you want to do a local fundraiser um, to uh, use your money to support this, that would be great. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Elizabeth Parker to talk a little bit about um, Giving Tuesday and that those funds this year are going to go towards the Million Dollar Bike Ride International Recipes Grant. I'm Elizabeth, my son, um, my youngest son, Ezra, has a music drum. Um, my oldest son, Judah, is there in the pictures, and my husband, Josh. Um, and I, yeah, manage um, social media for Recipes Network. Next slide, please. <laughs> so Giving Tuesday is um, a global day of giving, um, with so much emphasis put on uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Uh, giving Tuesday allows people an opportunity to give. Um, and so that will take place on December 1st. Um, and the great thing is that Facebook will match donations up to $7 million. So um, beginning 8 a.m. on December 1st, um, that's when the matches will begin. And then once the $7 million are gone in matching funds, then they're gone. But all of the donations that we receive um, that day are great. Last year, we actually raised about $8,500 in just one day. Um, so what you guys can do is um, put a donate button on your Facebook page. Um, and we will also set up like a donation page and you're always welcome to just reshare anything that we post ourselves on Recipes Network um, on our Facebook page. So a few ways that you can help um, do a successful uh, fundraiser for Giving Tuesday are just to simply share a picture of your family, of your child, however much you know you want to share personally, just to put a face with Recipes Network and share why supporting research is important to you personally. Um, people are more, um, you know, prone to give when they have a personal connection. And especially at the end of the year, people are often looking for reasons to give. Um, you know that 2020 has been a challenging year and not everyone will be able to give but you can support us simply by following us on social media and resharing our posts because um you know in today's world um our our digital marketing and our social media marketing is um so valuable and helps us uh, spread the word um to educate and to raise money for research um Another way that you can help us is by selecting Recipes Network USA on your Amazon Smile account. Um, so any of those purchases that you make um, on Amazon, 5% of those will go to support Recipes Network, and that's always um, a really easy way to support us as well. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about how to set up a giving page on Facebook or add the donate button. Um, I'm always happy to help, and I will try this week to do like kind of like a how-to video of how to add the donate button or set up a giving page on Facebook so that you can do your own Giving Tuesday little um, mini campaign. And all of that money will go, like um, Lisa Schell said, to support the Million Dollar Bike Ride um, Research Grant. Great. Let's do it this way. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Elizabeth, for the technical challenges. I'm just going to keep it out of slideshow because it, for some reason, it's um, like getting stuck. So if we do it this way, I think it'll be easier. Um, so thanks so much for Elizabeth for talking about um, Giving Tuesday, and we hope to see um, people get involved. And now we're going to hand it over to Beth. Everybody, my name's Beth. Um, I am the secretary on the board at Recipes Net, and I have um, a son, Sam, who has Noonan syndrome, and that's how I got involved in the, the organization. Um, I typically work on um, writing, reviewing grants, um, other research-related things, because my background is as a, a research scientist. 
Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So I'd like to tell you about some research opportunities. Um, one first one real quick, and then we'll get to Dr. Dobler's presentation. Um, and we just want to remind you, we, we provide you with, um, you know, opportunities that we hear about from clinicians and other researchers, um, genetic counselors, both, um, you know, medical, clinical, as well as interview-based um, tr trials or, or interventions. Um, and these are just suggestions. We, we try to make you aware of this research that's going on. Um, but we'll remind you that it's important to talk to your doctor first about the benefits and risks of participating in any type of study. So next slide, please. Um, so this one, I just want to mention, I have sent it out um, to people through, through an email um, blast, but there is a genetic counselor, master's student, Madeline Dyke, with her um, principal investigator, her mentor at the University of Maryland. And they're looking for any families that have um, Noonan syndrome couplets. And they define couplet as a parent and a child that have both been diagnosed with the same condition. And so they would like to gain knowledge from this study to help genetic counselors better support and counsel individuals and families with Noonan syndrome. So it's a survey based um, um, uh, phone interview and they're looking for participants. And so you can see that um, co their contact information there. And if you are interested, um, we recommend reaching out fairly soon because the study recruitment ends uh, at the beginning of December. And so now I would like to introduce Dr. Dauber. Um, he is currently Chief of Endocrinology at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC. He's a pediatric endocrinologist by training and he works in all areas of pediatric endocrinology, but specializes in studying and treating growth disorders. And so he's gonna tell you about a clinical trial that they've initiated um, to, to recruit and, and treat members that, that have rasopathies as well as other growth disorders. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Dauber. Thanks for joining us today. No problem, it's my pleasure. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak uh, with the group. I really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, Lisa, would you prefer that I just share my screen or do you want to just advance your slides, whichever is easier? I can just advance them unless you would prefer. That's fine. No, that's okay. okay. All right, so why don't we go to the next slide? So, our study is looking at a medication called basorotide in uh, five different genetic categories of short stature, one of those categories being uh, the entire group of children with rosopathies. So, I thought I would just give you some brief background. Um, so you may be aware that the way all individuals grow, the way kids grow, uh, is that we have things called the growth plate, which are uh, areas at the end of our bones um, that are made of cartilage and have cells in them called chondrocytes, which make your bones grow longer. And the chondrocytes have these different zones in the growth plate. And just pictured on the right here is a schematic of the fact that there are many different factors that affect how those chondrocytes grow. If we go to the next slide. And one of those factors that's very important is a factor called CNP or C-type natriuretic peptide. Um, and back, you know, for now decades, this has been known to be really important for growth. And this is just one experiment showing that when they looked at growth plates from rats, as they add more CNP in the Petri dish to the growth plates, the growth would, uh, the growth plate cultures would grow significantly taller. And when they looked at the exact mechanism, it affected multiple of the different zones in the growth plate and it stimulates the, the cartilage that's supposed to say matrix production and increase the number and size of the different types of chondrocytes. Um, so this is a very important factor regulating growth. If you go to the next slide, um, we found now actually though that there are individuals around the world who have activating mutations either of the gene that codes for CNP itself or pictured here are of the receptor for that C-type natriuretic peptide gene. It's called the NPR2 receptor. And those individuals are very tall. So pictured in the middle here, uh, is it a patient from the Netherlands who's seven feet, 
three inches tall and he had had actually surgery to help fuse his growth plates because he was still growing. Um, and otherwise these individuals were relatively healthy with some you know, mild skeletal issues as well. But this shows us that if you increase the amount of C-type natural peptide or the signaling through that pathway, it will increase growth in individuals. So if we look at the next uh, slide, this now a number of pharmaceutical companies have taken advantage of this knowledge to start to develop new therapies for growth disorders using CNP. So the therapy that's the furthest along is a medication called Basortide, which is made by a company named Biomarin. And uh, this is a paper that was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at their phase two study of Basortide in children with achondroplasia. Um, so you may be familiar with achondroplasia. It's the most common form of dwarfism, genetic form of dwarfism. And what this study showed was that the medication was safe, you know, with relatively few side effects. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And that there was a dose-dependent somewhat increase in growth in children with achondroplasia when they were treated with C-type natural peptide. So each of these colors represents a different dose cohort. Um, and what's pictured here is the growth velocity. And what you see is from the baseline growth velocity, uh, there was an increase of around two centimeters per year, and that seemed to be sustained over multiple years. Okay, if we go to the next slide. So Biomarin followed this up with a phase three study, which was just published this year in the Lancet. And uh, what they did, this was a randomized placebo-controlled trial, again, only in children with achondroplasia. And again, they showed that the children who received basoratide had an increased growth rate compared to those who received placebo. And pictured on the right is a plot that just shows in all different subgroups, whether it's boys or girls, different ages, different heights. To start out with all of them, it was beneficial in the children who received the basoratide. All right, so if we go to the next slide. So I've been speaking with uh, Biomarin for a number of years now, saying that I think this medication, this idea of increasing the CNP signaling would be beneficial not just for children with achondroplasia, but for many other uh, conditions that lead to short stature. And I'll just focus today on the resopathies. Um, and pictured on the right here is a, a schematic of the chondrocyte, that cell in the growth plate. And if you'll notice, right in the middle, towards the right there, there's that RAF, RAF, MEC, MAP kinase pathway highlighted in gray. Um, and this is that same central pathway that you saw on the resopathies net slide. So in achondroplasia, the issue is with a mutation, an activating mutation in FGFR3, which is that receptor, the pink receptor in the top left there. And the treatment that is being used is that CNP triangle binding to its receptor in the top right. And those two pathways intersect directly at the resopathy pathway. And there's very reason, good reason to believe that if this medicine works for kids with achondroplasia, it should help with growth in children with all of the resopathies as they all lead to increased signaling through this RAS, RAF MEC um, signaling pathway. And if you go to the next slide, um, this has been shown actually now, other investigators, these are not my studies, other investigators have looked at mouse models of resopathies. So pictured on the left here is a model of CFC syndrome, right, of cardiofacial cutaneous syndrome. It's a specific mutation, the VRAF gene. And what you see is that uh, the mouse um, who has the uh, mutation, but has received CNP, and right next to that are the growth plates, um, are able to grow much better and actually achieve a normal length compared to mice that do not have the mutation. And then similarly on the right is a mouse model of neurofibromatosis type one, um, where again, administering a type of C-type natural peptide, and this is not visoratide, it's not the same medication as we're using today, it's just showing the same principle that if you're increasing C-type natural peptide in these two models of risopathies, you're able to improve growth. And uh, on the right is showing the actual uh, histology of the growth plate, showing the actual cells, how it can you know, normalize how they look uh, in the growth plate. So if you go to the next slide. 
So what we're doing now is a study uh, where we are going to treat children with any of those five genetic groups that I showed on the previous slide, one of the groups being resopathies, um, with vasorotide and see whether those children have improved growth uh, over uh, the course of treatment. And the, uh, I'll get to the inclusion criteria in a second, but the basic design of the study is that uh, children will come for a screening visit, and for the first six months, they won't be on any therapy. And the reason for that is that since we're doing, you know, each child is very different from the others, right? Whether just as in the risopathies, every kid is different, you know, there are different mutations, different other medical issues that we need to just get a baseline growth rate for each child so we know how fast they're growing to start out with without medication. And then all of them will get started on the sortide. So there's no placebo control in the study. This is a phase two study. Every child who enrolls will receive the medication, um, but just has the six month observation period and then a period of one year will about where they will be receiving the medication. And the medication is given as an injection. It's a daily injection, a subcutaneous, a small shot. It goes right under the skin. It's given with an insulin syringe. So it's a tiny, tiny needle. And uh, it's something you would be taught to administer at home, you know, by our team. And uh, very similar to giving growth hormone at home. Um, and in total, the study then would take 18 months, the six months of observation, the 12 months of treatment. Um, and during that time, there would be four visits to Children's National at Washington, DC. We are the only uh, location in the world actually offering this medication outside of achondroplasia. So this is the kind of, we're the only place giving the medication. And uh, we will cover all of the travel costs. We'll come to that on the next slide. Um, but you would fly in or drive in or train in, whatever it's easiest, to Washington, DC uh, for those four study visits. Um, and uh, I can go into maybe, let me go over the inclusion criteria and then I'll tell you a little bit about what happens at those visits. So the inclusion criteria are the kids must be between the age of three and their 11th birthday for boys and 10th birthday for girls. And the reason for that is we want all of the kids not to have entered puberty during the course of the study. Um, and not, I'm sorry, not to be pubertal because that can affect how fast they're growing. Um, the need to have short stature. So if you have, as you know, there's quite a lot of clinical variability in uh, the various conditions in the resopathy. So if you're growing already at the 25th percentile, we won't be treating you with this medication at least to start out with. So you must have a height below 2.25 standard deviations and eventually, and also have a normal BMI, body mass index, so you can't be underweight for your height. You must have a documented mutation in one of those five categories. And we have a whole list of all the rosopathy genes that can be involved, but basically any gene that uh, leads to a rosopathy for which there's a genetic variant is are, the patients are eligible. They can't have growth hormone deficiency. They can't be treated at the same time with growth hormone. So uh, if they've previously been treated with growth hormone, that would be fine. But then for the course of the study, it needs to stop. Um, and in my personal experience, growth hormone can be very beneficial for some patients uh, with certain conditions, but it also does not always work. And there are concerns about using it in other conditions as well. So for patients who have not had a good response or who for some reason, uh, the, the physicians, the family are not interested in pursuing growth hormone therapy, this might be an interesting alternative. You can't have a medical uh, contraindication. So um, many cardiac conditions are okay but any conditions for which a drop in blood pressure could lead to a problem, uh, initially we're not going to include. So the specific ones are hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, aortic stenosis or regurgitation, and that's for safety reasons for this initial trial. And you must live in the United States uh, for the duration of the study. So for regulatory reasons, we're not allowed to give the investigational drug to children who will be residing outside Side of the United States. Um, so just briefly, as I said, at the screening visit, you come, you basically get some measurements, uh, blood draw, and um, we do a screening EKG and echocardiogram. And that's that uh, first visit. When you come back for the first, for that next visit, it's actually a two-day visit. 
the, where we in, give the medication for the first time on day one and then again on day two. That first day is a very long day, mostly for just safety monitoring. We give you the medicine and watch through the course of the day to make sure that uh, the child is, doesn't have any adverse reactions. We also will, at each of the subsequent visits, be putting in an IV and getting drug levels over the first few hours after we give the medicine. We'll be doing some x-rays of the hands and the spine, um, doing some questionnaires as well, and a bone density scan. And then the visits at uh, six months and 12 months are very similar. So the logistics, as I said, it's four visits to Washington, D.C. over the course of 18 months. All of the travel costs are covered for the patient and one parent. We are uh -oh. hoping and our full, our full intention is to have and it seems to be helping them. We plan on uh, extending the protocol to allow for them to continue on the medication uh, for multiple years after that. Um, so that is the intention, but that is not uh, set up yet because we're not yet to that point. And of course, uh, study participants, this is obviously completely voluntary, and study participants can decide to withdraw or not participate at any points during the study uh, if they change their mind. And all results from the study will be shared with the participants after the study is completed. And as we move on, we will be happy to share any abstracts or papers that are presented on the way. I was asked to address COVID considerations. So, uh, you know, the, the situation always may change, but at where we are right now is that um, travel is permitted at our hospital for medical care. This is considered, uh, while it is definitely a research study, uh, no, I wanna make sure that's totally clear, it is considered uh, medical care for which the child may benefit. So uh, it is still allowed to go on. Obviously we take all of the safety precautions at the hospital, Everyone wears masks and face shields and washes their hands. Everyone gets screened. Uh, so everyone gets screened for symptoms, you know, before they come in each day. Um, so those are the current regulations. Depending on how long you're going to be in DC, you know, you may need to get a negative COVID test prior to travel. We're not insisting on that right now. Uh, but really, it is up to each family to decide their own comfort level with traveling to Washington, you know, to take part of that study. Um, all right, and we currently, the goal of the study I didn't mention was to have 35 uh, individual participants. We already have nine children enrolled in the study. They're all in that six month observation phase right now. So we don't have any preliminary results yet, um, but there is a child with Noonan syndrome in that group of nine. So the benefits, this study is primarily being done to see if it improves growth in uh, children with these conditions. Um, so the potential benefit is that it could make the kids grow better. Um, we are also doing quality of life surveys, uh, specifically looking at the effects of short stature on individuals' quality of life. But I would say that there, that is a long debate on how important uh, stature is for individuals' quality of life. And I think that's an individualized discussion I'm happy to have with people you know, and you can have with your physicians as well. So in general, this medication appears to be quite safe. There, were, there have been zero serious safety events in all of the trials for achondroplasia and all of the uh, healthy initial adult volunteers. Um, now, this medication has not been given to people without achondroplasia or except for those initial healthy adult volunteers. So, uh, there still could be unknown side effects, but in general, as I said, there have been no serious safety events. There are minor, like with any injectable medication, there's some minor uh, reactions at the injection sites, just some local pain, redness, irritation, all of which have self-resolved. Um, there had, this medication can lead to a lower blood pressure. So um, in almost all of the children who have received it, that has only been picked up by close monitoring of their vital signs. They've not had any symptoms. A few kids, like three or so, have gotten temporarily a little bit lightheaded, which has gone away with no intervention as well. Um, and they found basically that as long as the kids have eaten and drink and drank something before they get their shot first thing in the morning, the symptom they don't really develop symptoms. Um, but that is something that we monitor for during the study visits. And the theoretical concern, uh, this is a concern that we're monitoring for is that theoretically, if the kids start to grow too much or too fast, it could lead to excessive bone growth and potentially worsen scoliosis or some body disproportion that hasn't been seen 
in the children with achondroplasia, but that's a theoretical concern based on our kind of knowledge of what could happen if you grow, if you give too much CNP to somebody. All right, and then on the next slide, I won't go through all of these, but just to show that we're doing a lot of different uh, analyses in these studies. So the primary endpoints are looking at, you know, the safety if there are adverse events and the effect on height and growth rate. Uh, then we're also looking at body proportions, the effect of bone age x-rays, and then some exploratory endpoints looking at pharmacokinetics, bone density, looking at some biomarkers of the effect, looking at quality of life uh, surveys as well. So that is an overview of the study. I think the next slide just says that I'm happy to answer any questions. I do see one question uh, in the chat. Maybe I'll just address that and then open it up. Um, so this is from a mother of uh, a child with a RAF1 mutation with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it's a good question if I think kids with these heart issues will ever be able to use this drug. I really think that it is going to be a kind of an individualized risk benefit conversation with your uh, clinician, with your doctors, depending on the degree of heart, heart, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and what we learn more about how much of an effect this medicine has on blood pressure. So, you know, really, like I said, there have not been any significant hypotension events where like nobody's lost conscious. The only one person lost consciousness in the initial trial because they got their blood drawn and the kid passed out, but not related to the medicine. It was just they saw the needle going in and the kid whew, took a little bit of a, a nap on the table for a few minutes and was obviously totally fine like anyone uh, <laughs> when that occurs. But otherwise, you know, there really haven't been any serious events. So um, if it continues to, if the data shows that with good hydration, the low blood pressure really isn't an issue, then it may get opened up to children with uh, more significant cardiac issues. But I think that's gonna need to be an individualized discussion. I think the concern might, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, is that because it's growth oriented that it could cause more hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But I also understood that this is really targeted at growth plates only. That's right. So uh, I'm sorry if I misunderstood that then. So um, the concern with the CMP, there are receptors, a few receptors in, in blood vessels, not as much in the heart tissue itself. It is in some tissues, but um, the, CNP's major effect is really in the growth plate. So it's not like growth hormone that has a big effect of growth of tissues all throughout the body. CNP's effect is really on the growth plate. So I don't think, you know, so there haven't been in the animal models, in the humans who have extra CNP, there have not been any signs of cardiac hypertrophy. So um, if that's the concern, I don't think that's going to be a major concern. I think that the, uh, I think the concern, the reason those are listed in our exclusion criteria is not because of that concern. It's because those specific cardiac conditions are conditions that if you dropped the blood pressure, it could affect your, how much blood your heart pumps, which is obviously not safe for you. So that's why uh, those are, are listed. So the plan for participation selection or overflow, three, 35 kids or more participate. So uh, that I will be ecstatic to, uh, you know, get to that situation. Um, you know, we've only been open for a few months and we do have nine uh, individuals enrolled already. So it's possible that we will get to that. Um, I think it depends on the breakdown of the 35 subjects. So uh, right now, being completely transparent, of the nine patients, six of them have hypochondroplasia, one has Noonan syndrome, and two have mutations in this gene called NPR2, which is the receptor for CMP. So I could see that if we enroll the majority of uh, patients with hypochondroplasia, which is very possible, and we only have maybe five or seven patients with resopathies, I could see that I will have a discussion with Biomarin and say, listen, we've only got really preliminary data in the resopathies. Let's, I'm going to stop enrolling patients with hypochondroplasia, but I'd like to go up to 50 subjects and enroll more patients with resopathies. So I think that is well within uh, possibilities. But I just don't know yet. I mean, it really depends on um, it really depends on what happens, you know, with enrollment. So comparing the advantages and disadvantages of growth hormone versus CMP and bisortide. So great question. I'm going to be completely frank. Um, so I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. I prescribe growth hormone all the time, right? Uh, like all the time. I've used it in tons of children. 
And I, I prescribe it all the time in Noonan syndrome um, as well. So when I see patients with Noonan syndrome, I really uh, it often prescribe uh, growth hormone, you know, obviously in discussion with the family. So the advantages of growth hormone are, I would say, twofold. One, it is approved, right? So it's approved for Noonan syndrome. Um, it's not approved for any of the other resopathies, but it's approved obviously for other indications as well. But it's approved for Noonan syndrome, which means insurance companies will often, most of the time, cover it, depending on your insurance company. But um, so that's one thing. And there are, so recombinant human growth hormone was first made in 1980 something. I don't remember the exact year, I think around 85. So there are 35 years or so of experience of using growth, recombinant human growth hormone in hundreds of thousands of children around the US. So its safety profile is very well known. And there are risks associated with growth hormone that are known. There are risks of increased intracranial pressure. There are risks of a slipped capital femoral epiphysis. That's a slippage of the hip joints. There's risks of worsening scoliosis. There's risks of increasing insulin resistance. Those are all known and quantified and are rare. Um, so uh, in general, it's a very safe medication. Um, the, and it's known that on average, children with Noonan syndrome, let's focus on, uh, do respond. Um, and, you know, they don't, it's not like kids with growth hormone deficiency, but they, they can grow more uh, with growth hormone. But it's also known that the response is very variable. Um, and uh, growth hormone does not really specifically address the uh, pathophysiology that, that is found in rhizopathies. It's non-specific. It's specific to something else. You know, it's basically like just trying to throw a um, um, hormone that we know promotes growth at the growth plate, but it's not specific to, that's not the defect that, you know, is happening on a molecular level in the rosopathies. So it's not really targeted, I would say. And the other downside is, at least in some of the rosopathies, and you guys probably know this better than I, uh, more than others, there are at least theoretical risks of increased uh, cancer predispositions. And um, perhaps, you know, in certain ones. So growth hormone, if you have growth hormone excess, it does increase your risk for certain types of tumors. There's no question about that. So uh, there are theoretical risks, and theoretical is what they are, to... Um, uh, to using growth hormone in individuals who are predisposed to certain cancers. So there are some other conditions which have very clear predispositions to cancer where I would be exceedingly hesitant to use uh, growth hormone in. Um, now, the benefits of the sortide is that it is, from a molecular level, quite targeted at the pathway, the exact pathway that is um, affected by risopathies. The downside of it is that it's never been done, right? So that's why we're doing the study. But I can honestly say to you that I have no idea how this is going to work in, uh, in patients. Like, I think it should work, right? It works in kids with achondroplasia. It works in mice. I think it should work. I think it should be safe. Like, I take that very, very seriously. You know, this is not something we're doing cavalierly. There's, uh, this was after much discussion with the FDA in meetings with them and you know, review by scientific uh, review boards and a lot of consideration to make this protocol as safe as possible. Um, but it is not, it's still not known, right? Just to be totally frank, you know, we, this hasn't been done yet. So it is a research study and you need to know that. Um, and I think from my understanding of the biology, it should have less risk. I actually think it should have less risks than growth hormone. But that's what I'm hoping for, and that's what we're hoping to see. Okay, so that's a comparison of that. Um, do I plan to track other developmental features during the course of the study for other rats who might have a number of developmental issues? That's a great question. The answer is no. Um, and the reason the answer is no is that uh, we also, similarly, um, the sorotide and C-type natriuretic peptide is not known or thought at all to have an effect on developmental outcomes, brain development, or anything like that. So that's really not the focus of this study. Um, not that it's not important, it's probably much more important in many, many ways, but that's not the focus of, of this study. Um, like I said, the only questionnaires we'll be doing is about quality of life issues uh, related to stature. Um, so there's a standardized questionnaire that parents, and if 
able to, the children answer as well. Have I ever used growth hormone or vasoratide for a child with Noonan syndrome with a history of uh, juvenile myeloma monocytic leukemia? Oh, I answered your question. So the answer is no, I have not. Uh, so vasoratide, definitely not. Um, and I would strongly counsel patients to and families to, uh, you know, we are talking about stature. I think you have to be very, very, I personally am quite risk averse. So I'm quite conservative when it comes to using growth hormone. I'm sure there are other people who, if it has resolved, would do this, but I would be very hesitant to recommend that. Um, uh, and you wrote, the next person said, your son is too young right now, but is there a way to stay informed about the study progress as he gets older? Yes. So good question. So I'm always happy to answer questions. So there are two ways that you could uh, stay informed. So one is, you know, the study is listed at uh, clinicaltrials.gov, which is the you know, national uh, registry required by the, the governments for all clinical trials. So we obviously have complied with that. And if you'll see right there, it says studies recruiting. So if the study stops recruiting, we'll update that in that registry and it'll say, you know, completed enrollment or I don't know what it says actually, but uh, you know, it'll say something different. Um, and hopefully, you know, once we have results in, down the road, we'll be presenting this at meetings to groups, you know, sharing them as widely as we can. Um, uh, but if you ever want to just shoot me an email and say, hey, you know, are you still, Andrew, are you still enrolling patients in the study? I'd be happy to answer that question um, and see where things go. And Lee Johnson asked, do you have plans to track other developmental features during the course of the study for other RAS participants who might have a number of developmental issues? Right, so, um, so as I said, the answer to that is uh, no, we're not really focused on other developmental issues right now. And I, I received two questions via email sure. um, from a CFC international family. Um, they sure. asked, why was this test not, um, why was this test not um, done internationally? Why are you only doing it in the US? Oh, uh, the simple answer for that is that I live in the United States um, and not to be facetious, but uh, so I'm under the regulation of the FDA um, and I'm doing this as an academic, you know, hospital research investigator. I don't work for Biomarin. I don't get any personal money from Biomarin. Biomarin, I should say, is paying, you know, they're giving us the medicine and paying for the study. Uh, but I wrote the entire protocol. We have our own independent data safety and monitoring board. I went to the FDA and met with them. Biomarin was not involved in any of those processes. Um, so um, I, as, since I work in the United States, and I'm regulated by the FDA, I'm only able to do studies in the United States. I think that my hope is if this works, right, if we show good evidence that this is beneficial for children with any of the disorders, but for, you know, and specifically risopathies, I'm going to be knocking on the door at Biomarin and the other drug companies and say, hey, guys, this is a really good therapy for risopathies. You need to do the phase three study, right? You need to do the large international multi-center study um, in order to get this approved for, for that condition. And uh, that's my goal, you know, um, and then obviously they would do it. And, you know, those companies are perfectly capable of doing it. In multi and, and the achondroplasia study was done all over the world. And they asked, when will the results be available? When do you think the results will be available? So um, it depends on how fast we enroll patients, uh, really. So, you know, starting in a year from February. So February, 2022, our first patient will complete the study. Um, and within a few months after that, we'll have results of uh, nine patients. And then, I don't know, then it just depends on how many more patients you know enroll and how fast they do. Other questions I can answer? I think that's it. Okay, great. Thank so you. no problem. If people are interested um, on that lat here, I'll put my I'll put it up. I can put it up. The last slide has uh, my email and our study coordinator Tara McCarthy's email. Um, and feel free to shoot me shoot us an email and tell us if you're interested and we'll set up. Uh, we're happy to set up one on one zoom calls with we've done that so far for every family to do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call to really go over all of the details of the study and logistics and um, 
make sure you know what you're signing up for. Thank you so much, Dr. Dauber. No problem, it's my pleasure. Have a good evening, everyone. I'm gonna sign off. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Rosopolis Network Contact Registry, which is part of our, our program. Uh, uh, at Rosopathy's Net. It's, uh, so a contract registry is a way for families to share a little bit of information, mostly how to reach back out to you with us so that we can figure out whether you're, uh, you or your family are a good study, a good uh, a candidate for a study that you might want to participate in. So information provided to us is confidential and I'll share what that information is on the next page. But uh, before that, uh, we don't share your information outside the Rosopolis network. All that happens is that we kind of uh, look at studies such as the one we uh, kind of looked at today and see if there's kind of, if there seems to be a good match between uh, the, what's going on with, with your family and what's going on with the study. And then we prospectively would reach out to you uh, and ask you if you wanted to reach out to the study and be a participant in the study. Okay, next page. Uh, yeah, so the things that we uh, ask you for information about is just, you know, basic contact information, age of uh, the affected individual, uh, where you are, how to get in touch with you, uh, diagnosis and mutation, um, obviously the status of life, uh, and then caregiver information is important to be able to sort of maintain that that relationship with you as the as as things go on, one of the most important things about maintaining these registries is to be able to uh, really reliably get back in touch with the with the family. So that's why we kind of go the extra mile as far as the caregiver information is concerned. Okay, that's it on the contact registry. And I also want to talk a little bit uh, just in closing, and we're we're almost done about our. Um, Symposium for 2021 um, that was planned to be, uh, as all of our symposia have been in the past, an in-person event, but uh, we've decided that the safe and prudent thing to do is to go virtual next year, even though it's sort of fairly late in the year. You know, we've got special populations, both in the researchers and clinicians who come to us, they have to take extra special care of ourselves and a lot of our families do as well. So next. So the things that we do for families at the in-person symposia, remember the symposia are sort of quasi-scientific meetings where clinicians and researchers get together uh, and present their results. Uh, and we also invite the families to, to attend and participate. But the things we do specifically for families at in-person meetings are a, a recap in layman's terms uh, for sort of each technical area for each risopathy uh, given by a research in lay terms, lay, layman's terms uh, with the question and answer. We also do, there is also the opportunity for informal meetings at meals and the end of day to, you know, talk with clinicians, talk with researchers, people that you don't know, people that you, and obviously for the families to get together and chat with each other. Um, there are poster sessions uh, typically uh, by junior uh, junior researchers or grad students or something like that. The great thing about poster sessions is that uh, interaction with the poster session is very informal and self-paced. So you get to have a real dialogue with the researcher, ask them what their priorities are, kind of let them know what yours are, that kind of stuff. And then of course there are presentations, uh, invited presentations from science experts in the risopathies. Uh, there are also, Lisa reminds me that there, at the poster session, uh, there are also families who present and uh, talk about their experiences and clinicians and researchers get to meet them and kind of uh, be able to put a face to the people who they are, uh, you know, helping in the laboratory, if you will. Okay, for 2021, um, we plan to do as much of uh, the above as as we can, although it's obviously going to be virtualized. There's some um, some good things about electronic format that we all know so well that you can uh, drop in and drop out and uh, participate very easily to the extent that it's possible. Um, there, we certainly have the opportunity for breakout sessions. Some of our uh, uh, meeting chairs have already suggested um, sort of electronic venues that really facilitate that kind of thing. So we're going to be looking into that. So stay in touch and follow us along on the on the website. And obviously, we we need to keep everybody associated with Rosopathies as safe as we can, and to do our part to stop the spread of the disease. And 
obviously we would love to get back together. We really enjoy the person in person meetings and we're gonna reestablish that in 23, all things being as fortunate as they might. Okay, I believe that is it. Uh, Lisa Schill, do you wanna close us out? Or Lisa Schroyer, do you? Yeah, no problem. I mean, I have to, I can unmute um, Lisa Schroyer too. Um, and Elizabeth, um, one of our board members who I felt so bad when I couldn't advance her slides to talk about um, Giving Tuesday. Yeah, I think I think what I'll do so that we can promote it properly is I will uh, do a live Facebook on Tuesday. So it's like a one week uh, before Giving Tuesday um, warning. And that way I can walk everybody through how to add a donate button or a fundraising page to your um, individual Facebook or to just reshare the one that I will create for Resopathies Network. Hey, um, thank you to everyone. Lisa Scheuer, I don't know if you have anything else to say and if anyone has any questions or um, we always would love to get more help. Um, we're all volunteer. So if anyone wants to help Resopathies Network, uh, we are always looking for, for help. Yes. <laughs> Anything else, Lisa, you'd like to add? I, I, nothing more. I really want to thank everybody for coming and spending a chunk of your Sunday with us. And uh, please share the information um, we shared today with your networks and um, we'll keep on connecting. Thank you so much, everyone. And sorry again for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thanks for, for hanging with us through them. And uh, we'll talk to you sometime in the near future. Bye. Yes.